In this video, we'll talk about herpes simplex virus. This is a high yield video for USMLE step one. Stay tuned till the end. So this is the herpes simplex virus and we are going to talk about the structure at first. So this is a double stranded DNA virus. Here you can see the glycoproteins on the surface, then the envelope. They have the genomic DNA uh, double stranded as a genomic material. They have structural proteins and the capsid. So now let's see where does this particular virus falls in the overall classification of double-stranded DNA viruses. So DNA virus can be divided into two halves, single-stranded and double-stranded. This falls under double-stranded enveloped virus and it, the family name is basically Harpis viridi. And then obviously we have to remember that the genome is basically double-stranded DNA and the structure is basically enveloped and icosahedral capsid is present in this particular virus. At any point of time, if you find it difficult to remember what type of virus this is, you just remember the mnemonic happy virus. All double-stranded DNA viruses are actually happy virus. So happy stands for herpes viridi, hepadna, adeno, uh, basically parvo, papova and uh, papilloma virus. So all of these are basically happy virus. Anyway, there are two types of herpes simplex viruses, HSV1 and HSV2. So HSV1 basically is responsible for orofacial infection. And HSV2 is associated with genital infections. But this is not a hard and fast rule. Basically, HSV1 can also affect the genitalia and HSV2 has the potential to infect the orofacial region as well. Now, if you talk about HSV1 and 2, HSV1 generally infects the child. And basically, its seroprevalence increases with age. HSV2 is primarily transmitted through the sexual contact. So basically people who are sexually in, uh, active, they are more affected by HSV2 subtype. So basically primary infection of HSV1 includes uh, gingivostomitis, basically pharyngitis and herpetic Whitlow, which is basically blisters near the fingernails, which is painful. And also from this, the virus can actually spread. There is a term known as Harpies gladi gladiatorium, because people who are basically wrestlers, they can transmit by physical contact with each other. Now, let's talk about the primary infections caused by HSV2. And generally, the genitalia is affected. This is how a healthy penis look like. And this is how a uh, penis of an indi infected individual look like. You can see there are rashes like appearance, which are like blisters, fluid filled, and they are quite itchy. So these are painful as well. They can be found in genitals, buttocks, and anus. Similarly, they can also be found in female around the vaginal region and the and anal region. And in females mostly, dysuria, that means painful urination, is pretty common. Sometimes there is systemic involvement including fever, headache and myalgia. So herpes simplex virus can also affect the eye. And which part of the eye is affected? The cornea and the conjunctivita. Generally there is swelling around the eyes, red eyes, rashes around the eye region. So when cornea is affected it leads to blurry vision and it has that branching dendritic uh, type appearance during this uh, vision and this is a pretty much characteristic of herpes then due to conjunctivita in infection there is pain itchiness sensitivity to the light redness etc now let's talk about herpes infection in the brain herpes simplex virus can spread to the cns and lead to inflammation in the brain. So the meninges can get affected, causing meningitis. Also, the brain parenchyma can get inflamed, causing encephalitis. And both this happens during reactivation phase. 
and we would we have to learn what is reactivation phase so let's slowly transition to the virus life cycle anyway the virus escapes to the bloodstream at the reactivation phase they can cross the blood brain barrier and eventually affect the brain parenchyma or the meninges so csf examination could be a good diagnostic tool to understand cns infection in herpes so basically there are several alterations which are found in the csf increased white blood cell elevated protein levels increased uh, red blood cells elevated lactate levels all these are pretty characteristic for herpes infection now let's talk about the replication cycle of herpes simplex virus so here is a epithelial cell and the herpes simplex virus binds to specific receptors we are not taking the name of these receptors for simplicity but anyway these receptors lead to receptor mediated endocytosis of this virus virus sheds off the uh, basically the envelope and the viral capsid is released into the cytosol and the dna actually enters the nucleus and that circularize inside the nucleus this particular viral dna can give rise to several proteins so there is some uh, particular uh, virus protein known as vp16 that recruits host transcriptional machinery to express immediate early genes so this immediate early mrna is produced and that ultimately lead to the production of immediate early proteins eventually delayed early mrna and delayed early proteins are produced and lastly the late proteins which generally are the structural port proteins of the virus are produced so all these components which are produced sequentially would be assembled in the endoplasmic reticulum and eventually a new viral particle would be generated meanwhile the viral dna would be replicating making more dna to be packaged in a new uh, virion so assembly of the viral particle is happening in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum then via the golgi they would be eventually released out of the cell so this kind of describe the cellular aspect of the viral uh, replication so all the epithelial cell can be infected and they can also shed off many virus and release many virus in the surroundings and you know in the genital region or near the face there are certain sensory nerve endings uh, which end up in several uh, ganglia right so basically after massive replication virus are ejected and they can actually be uh, uptaken by the nerve terminals and there is a retrograde transport of the viral capsid to the sensory neuronal cell bodies and they stays there in the ganglia for long time and when needed there could also be a latent state that means the genetic material is inside the neuron but all the viral particle is not pr produced so that means it's kind of like a hibernation mode eventually when required vi virus can virus particle can basically be reactivated viral assembly can happen they can move through in an anterograde fashion and again reinfect the epithelial cell this is how a two way transport inside the neuron takes place now when it comes to the neurons basically sacral and lumbar ganglia which are as a nearby to the genital region get affected by hsv2 infection whereas hsv1 infection basically affects the trigeminal ganglion uh, and basically this is the site of latent infection now basically in these ganglion in these cell bodies or the collection of cell bodies the virus can stay for long time all the circularized genetic material can stay inside the nucleus for very long duration and in that condition there are specific machinery which prevents the viral particle production at that point of time it's a latent phase and since this latent phase is so pronounced sometime the individual things they have recovered from the infection but after some point of time they can again have a reactivation of that uh, hsv infection so that is why reactivation is so important in context of hsv infection hsv2 reactivation is very frequent and basically it can happens even in a bouts of month often these are asymptomatic that that is why sometimes people don't bother and the virus just spreads during that course of time imagine a reactivation scenario and that point of time an individual is having sex or having uh, some sort of like 
close contact with a partner. That might lead to the viral transmission. So that is why HSV can literally propagate through a population silently. Now, Latin, so what we learned so far, there is latency and reactivation phase, which makes the HSV pretty unique. And there is asymptomatic shedding. While the virus is still there, there is no symptoms. So the individual might transfer the virus to the next individual even unknowingly. And we talked about seroprevalence. That means the seroprevalence of HSV1 is, one is pretty high in the um, young age and HSV2 seroprevalence is lower but still significant in sexually active population. Now let's talk about the transmission of the virus. It can happens, it, it can be transmitted from the mother to the fetus. It doesn't cross the placental barrier and directly infect the fetus. In fact, the baby gets infected during the time of birth. When, it is, when the baby is delivered through the infected vaginal canal, the baby gets infected. And if it is untreated, there are different kind of outcomes. So first outcome is localized infection which is limited to skin, eyes and mouth and there are vesicular lesions of the skin, there is eye infection and oral lesions and then there could be also nervous system manifestations which lead to seizure, lethargy, irritability, poor feeding habits, abnormal CSF profiles. So that is why sometimes the babies might be prescribed to undergo a lumbar puncture which is painful but might be required. If untreated and prolonged inflammation is there, then there could be disseminated infection which lead to sepsis and involvement of multiple organ. It can even compromise the functionality of many organs. So it could be pretty detrimental for the child. Now let's talk about the diagnosis. Diagnosis is pretty much done by clinical observation. So the blisters or the rashes are pretty much characteristic to herpes. Also, polymerase chain reaction based diagnosis is more um, accurate. It looks for specific viral genes which are very unique to the HSV and not present in any other kind of virus. And this can be detected from cerebrospinal fluid, blood or the swab from any other lesions. Additional diagnostic method includes viral culture, direct fluorescence antibody detection, um, basically serological test, etc. But these are not used very frequently. When it comes to treatment, obviously it's a viral infection. It has to be treated with antivirals. So antiviral agents such as acyclovir, uh, famicyclovir, then valacyclovir, all of these kind of antiviral agents can be used for the treatment of HSV. So I hope this video was useful and informative enough. If you like this video, give it a quick thumbs up. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. You can get many of these notes, flashcards in our Facebook, Instagram page. You can also visit our website where we have many quizzes regarding many topics. Links are provided in the description. See you in the next video. You can support our channel using super thanks. Please, we need your support. Your support, your small contribution is motivation for us to make more such videos. So see you in the next video.